Hey everybody, it's Neil. I have a very special episode of the Decoder podcast today with Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella. I'm actually sitting on the Microsoft campus right now. The company just announced a new version of the Bing search engine that's powered by OpenAI. OpenAI makes ChatGPT. Microsoft is using a new version of that model to run Bing, actually answer questions in the Bing search box, and there's a new version of the Edge web browser that has a chat box right next to it where you can just ask it to summarize web pages for you, do all kinds of things. It is a big new step in search. Microsoft is not being shy about directly competing with Google in search. And I got the chance to ask Sasha all about it. Sasha Nadella, you are the CEO of Microsoft. Thank you for coming on Decoder today. Thank you so much, Nadella, for having me. Uh, so Microsoft just announced a huge new version of Bing. It's powered by a bunch of open AI technology. A couple weeks ago, the company made a what was called a multi-billion dollar, multi-year investment in OpenAI. Tell us what's going on. Well, I mean, today's announcement is all about rethinking uh, the largest software category there is, search, uh, with this new generation of AI, because it's a platform shift and you get to sort of reimagine pretty much everything, right? Starting with uh, the core ranking. In fact, perhaps the most salient part of today's announcement is we've had the best gain in relevance uh, in the core ranking using some of these large models. Second is, it's not just, not just a search engine, it's an answer engine, because we've always had answers, but with these large models, the fidelity of the answers uh, just gets so much better. Uh, and then we've incorporated chat right into search, which is grounded in search data. So you can do a natural language prompt, which is or a query, which is long, you get a great answer, and then you can engage in a conversation with that as the grounding or the context. So it's about basically essentially bringing, in fact, a more sophisticated model, larger model, next generation model compared to chat GPT, and grounding it in search data. The other last thing we also added was a co-pilot for the web, um, so that you in Edge can be looking at any website or any document on a website, like a 10Q, for example, and then do things like summarization. So a whole lot of these features all coming together, uh, essentially, as the new Bing. So a really interesting piece of the puzzle here is a lot of this is powered by OpenAI and OpenAI technology. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman was on stage with you today. You've been working with OpenAI for three years, but you haven't acquired them. You've made a huge investment into them. Why work with an outside technology vendor for the largest software category in the world? Well, I mean, look, the, the, first of all, you've got to remember the, the, the relationship with OpenAI and our cooperation with OpenAI has many, got many facets. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is what we've done over the last four years uh, is to actually build out the core infrastructure on which OpenAI is built. I mean, this is these large models, uh, the training infrastructure and the infra infrastructure doesn't look like just vanilla cloud, right? So we have had to essentially evolve Azure uh, to be pretty specialized AI infrastructure on which OpenAI is built. And by the way, Inception is also using Azure. Character.ai is using Azure. There will be many others who will also use Azure infrastructure. So we are very excited about that part. And then, of course, we get to incorporate these large models inside of our products and make those large models available as Azure AI. And in all of this, we both have an investment return and we have a commercial return. Uh, and so we think we're well placed to partner. Like I will never assume that great partnerships can't be both great returns for our customers, shareholders, and Microsoft. There's a lot of talk today uh, in a presentation about the values that are coming into Bing, about the safety work that's being done, about the responsible AI work that Microsoft has done for years. How do you make sure that bridges the gap to OpenAI, which is not your company, but obviously very tied very closely? And how do you make sure that your products inherit all those values, even when you're working with an outside company? Yeah, first of all, OpenAI cares about safety. I mean, in some sense, their entire inception was about how to think about safety in AI and alignment uh, in AI. And so we share that. And we've had our principles, as we talked about it today, Nilay, which is since 2016, we published the principles. And ever since, quite frankly, we've been very focused on what I'll call the hard work of incorporating it in the engineering practice of building products, right? Starting with design. One of the things I think a lot about is when you have, let's say, a new model coming, it's probably most important to actually put human in the loop versus design the human out uh, so that you can, in fact, ensure that the human agency judgment is what you use to train the model to be aligned with human feedback. So that's kind of what we're doing. Like when I look at even what we're doing in uh, Bing is taking it even one step further 
to even ground it in the context, which is search. So I always say, look, these, nat these generative models just don't randomly generate stuff. You prompted it. So there's a whole lot you can do in the meta prompt uh, and the sequence of prompts you generate, which we can assist with. So there's a lot of, I would call it, product design choices one gets to make of when you think about AI, AI safety. Then you let's come at it the other way, right? You have to take real care on the pre-trained data, right? Because that's where, you know, after all, models are trained on pre-trained data. What's the quality, the provenance uh, of that pre-trained data? That's a place where we've done a lot of work. Second, then the safety around the model, right? At runtime, we have lots of classifiers around harmful content or bias, which we then catch. Uh, and then, of course, the takedown. Ultimately, in the application layer, uh, you also have more of the safety net for it. So this is all going to come down to, I would call it, the everyday engineering practice. And guess what? Search is like that. Search is an AI product. I mean, one of the things, we, we, it's kind of interesting that we are now talking about a new algorithmic breakthrough in these mo large models. But we've always had AI models for you know, decades now. And we've really built you know, our sense of what is authoritative, how to detect authoritative, how to ensure harmful content doesn't get through. And those are all practices that will now be used. So that leads me to, I think, the value exchange of search right now. So in a traditional search model, I ask Bing uh, some question. It might return some snippet, but it usually returns a list of links. I go visit a web page. The creator of that web page might capture some advertising revenue or something else. Now you're just answering the question directly, and you've trained the model on other people's information, other people's reporting, and yeah, yeah. biased in favor of reporting. How do you make sure that they get the value back? It's a very important. In fact, one of the biggest things that is different about the way we have done the design, I would really encourage people to go look at it. This is about, like, look, at the end of the day, search is about fair use. Uh, ultimately, all this content we only get to use inside of a search engine if you're generating traffic for the people who create it. And so that's why if you look at whether it's in the answer, whether it's in chat, these are just a different way to represent the 10 blue links, more in the context of what the user mm -hmm. wants. So the core measure, even what SEO looks like, if anything, that'll be the thing in the next multiple years, we'll all learn. Perhaps there will be new incentives in SEO to even generate more authoritative content that then gets in. Uh, so overall, everything you saw there had annotations, everything was yeah. linkable, and that'll be the goal, whether it's inside a search, whether it's in the answer, or even in the chat session. But if I ask the new Bing, what are the 10 best gaming TVs, and it just makes me a list, why should I, the user, then click on the the link to The Verge, which has another list of the 10 best gaming TVs? Well, I mean, that's a great question. But even there, you will sort of say, hey, where did these things come from? Mm -hmm. uh, and would you want to go dig in? Like that, yeah. today, even Search Today has that. Like we have answers. They may not be as high quality answers. They just are getting better. So I don't think of this as a complete departure uh, from what is expected of a search engine today, which is supposed to really respond to your query, while giving them the links that they can then click on, like ads. Uh, and Search works that way. The reason I ask this is, obviously, when you say you're taking on the largest software category in the world, it's search. There's a dominant player in Google. If Google stops sending as much traffic from its search engine results page to publishers, to creators, to other websites, uh, regulators around the world would freak out because they have a dominant market share. Bing does not have a dominant market share. When you evaluate the risks, both IP risks, legal risks, regulatory risks, you say, well, look, we don't have the share. We can take we can take a step forward in how we present these results in a way that our competitor cannot? I, I, that's not how I come at it. <laughs> I'm just curious. I, I come at it primarily on, like, basic. Today, if you look at the search category, it's, it's great. It, it works 50% of the time. <laughs> it doesn't work for the other 50% yeah. of the time. So I think what really I want to do is to go back and say, look, is there some new powerful technology that can make a search a better product? without fundamentally changing how search gets permission to even exist as a product, which is other people's content organized in useful ways so that users can find them. To me, that is the category. And so we will live and die by our ability to help publishers get their content to be seen by more people. 
Up to now, you're absolutely right. Google dominates this market by a significant margin. We hope, in fact, if anything, having two you know, or multiple search engines, they're not just us, there'll be others who will be competitors. By having more, let's call it evenly spread search share, uh, will only help publishers all get traffic from multiple sources. And by the way, advertisers better pricing. Uh, and so publishers will make more money, advertisers will make more money, and users will have great innovation. Oh, and think about what a great day it'll be. <laughs> uh, I'm eager for there to be more comp competition in search. What I'm curious about is if more and more people are producing more and more AI content, and that becomes the base layer that you're training against. So if instead of me writing a story about the Chinese spy balloon, I ask Bing to write such a story, and that gets fed back into Bing, eventually the amount of original content in the ecosystem begins to wither. Is that a feedback loop that you're worried about? So, uh, absolutely. But the way I look at it and say is what people sort of talk about, like my yeah. daughter sent me this unbelievable example the other day. She's taking some French lit class and she said, hey, I was using this AI tool to summarize what I was writing and it took me two hours. Mm -hmm. Because she was doing meta prompts and prompts and learned more about that text than ever before. And so I feel like a little bit, let's give ourselves a little permission. Mm -hmm to think about what is original content. Because as I said, AI just, just doesn't generate it. You prompted it. You have a draft, which you edit. Today, I mean, I would be unemployable, but for the red squiggly and Microsoft <laughs> Word, because that's what helps me write anything. So I think we've used and we've evolved to use new tools. I think of it that way, right? I think it, yes, it'll create, you know, some of the drudgery of knowledge work may go away. Uh, but doesn't mean I won't enjoy. Like, in fact, the best place in LA, I feel it, is in uh, GitHub Copilot, right? Coding, I mean, it's not like suddenly you're not coding. If anything, you're more in the flow of coding with some of these prompts. You in, read more code, you accept the more code. So I think it's just a different way for us to perhaps enjoy our knowledge work more. That brings us to the second product, right, which is the Copilot inside of the Edge browser. If you look at Bing, you have an opportunity now to capture market share from Google. If you look at Edge, you have an opportunity to capture market share from Chrome, potentially Safari, if you go to the, uh, if you go to the iPhone. Is that how you're seeing this? This is an inflection point. You have a new technology. You have a lead with this partnership with OpenAI. It's creating an opportunity for you to go take share, or is it you're expanding the category and you think you can initiate new users in a new way. Sort of, you know, I start always not from zero sum, but I sort of sort of look and say, hey, how does the category expand? How can we participate in that expansion? That's, I think, at mm -hmm. the foundational level. But at the same time, you know, there will be. Like, if these, are, these are places where the dominant browser is Chrome. I mean, forget anywhere else. On Windows, yeah. uh, Google makes more money than all of Microsoft, right? So let's start there. So there's a huge opportunity uh, for us if we got, got some additional share, well, for whether it's our browser or our search engine. And so that's kind of how I look at it, which is let's build first a product that is completely competitive in the marketplace that's actually serving user needs. Uh, and like all things in the other, I'm also, I'm not a one platform guy. I'm like, I want to ask, I grew up in a Microsoft yeah. that sort this of- This is your big change in Microsoft. Not your really, leadership, the right? Microsoft that I grew up in. Because yeah. I always remember <laughs> uh, that Microsoft software, like Office was on uh, the Mac before mm -hmm. even Windows. So that's kind of the Microsoft uh, that I learned from. And I'll always make sure that our software is everywhere where users want it. It's been a relative period of calm between Microsoft and Google. There was a, a previous period of, I would say, antipathy or more open antipathy. Recently, you've partnered on things like Android on some of your hardware. Um, you've partnered, I think, Microsoft 365 on Chromebooks is some partnership that was recently announced. Do you expect this new sort of head-on competition against their most important product to change that relationship? First of all, I mean, look, I have the greatest of admirations uh, for Google and what they've done. And, you know, they're, they're, they're an unbelievable company with great talent and, you know, and I have a lot of respect for Sundar and his team. So therefore, uh, I just want us to innovate, right? So there's always, I mean, we compete today. Uh, today was a day where we brought some more competition to search. We've been at it, but believe me, I've been at it for 20 years and I've been waiting <laughs> for it. Uh, but look, at the end of the day, let's not, you know, we, they're the 800 pound gorilla on this, which is uh, what they are. And I hope that with our innovation, um, they will definitely want to come out and show that they can dance. And I want people to know that we made them dance. And I think that'll be a great day. What was the moment in the development of the product where you said, okay, it's ready. We should announce it like this. 
with a pretty direct shot at the 800-pound gorilla. Was there a, a light switch that flipped for you? Was it a committee decision? How'd that work? Um, so when I first saw this new model, because the model that you saw today is the next generation model. That's so. Is that GPT-4? Or? I, I let Sam okay. at the right time talk about <laughs> his numbers. Okay. So it is the next generation model, and it's been done, as we said, we called it the Prometheus model, because as I said, we've done a lot to the model to ground it in search, right? So the search use case is pretty unique, and so we needed to ground it in that as well. So when I first saw the raw model back in the summer of, I'd say, 2022, is when I thought that this is a game changer uh, in terms of the search category, aside from everything else that I'm excited about, because I do care about Azure having these APIs even. Um, so we've been at it. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget my first query I did on the model, which I think sort of for me as growing up, you know, I always felt like if only I could read Rumi, translated into Urdu, transliterated into English. That was my dream. I just put that in as one long query, and it was magical to see it generated. And I said, man, this is different. And uh, you could have, I mean, I could have mm -hmm. programmed it, done some multi-turn. That was things. your first query? That was the query. You that are changed. one of the classiest people I've ever met in my entire life. I mean, that's like a very complicated. <laughs> it was just one of the, I don't know, Lorca. I mean, people <laughs> yeah. like, well, look, poetry is great, man. Uh, I mean, I, I buy it. My first query was like, are you alive? Uh, so that's where I would have gone. So you, you run this query, right, to translate, uh, Remy is an Indian poet, uh, Persian, Persian uh, into across two languages. Um, and you receive the response and you think, okay, this is a product or this is a product with revenue possibility or this is a product with market share possibility. Yeah, I mean, like all things, one of the things that I think about is Indian platform shifts, the two things have to happen. You have to retool pretty much every product of yours, mm -hmm. right? So you got to rethink it, whether it's on the way you build it, what its uh, core features are. Uh, like, it's kind of like, you know, how Microsoft had to pivot uh, for the cloud, right? Which mm -hmm. is you have to rethink Exchange. It was not an Exchange server, it was Exchange as a service. Or what we had to do with, um, you know, our server infrastructure. We had to rebuild, uh, essentially, a new core stack in Azure. So every time with transitions, you have to essentially rewrite it. That's mm -hmm. kind of how I, I think about it. The second thing is, you also have to think about the business model. Sometimes these transitions are pretty harsh. I'll tell you, the last transition from having, you know, the high share server business with great gross margins and saying, hey, the new business is called cloud and it's going to have one fourth the margins is like the new news, mm -hmm. was pretty harsh. So we made it. <laughs> uh, whereas in here, I look at this, there are two things. One is it's absolutely new tech, but it builds on cloud. Right? So that's one place where we already have relevance. And so there is the next generation of cloud. And second, in search, the economics are interesting, uh, which is we already have a profitable business, but with very little share. And so every day, I just want a few users and a little bit more gross margin. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I did see, I think, a tremendous opportunity for us to make some real progress here. So the model right now, the last like thing is an eleven billion dollar a year revenue business, something like that. Something like that. I think Amy is going to talk about. It. I don't know how she yeah. wants to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, an incredible hobby. I wish I had an eleven billion dollar a year hobby. Um, uh, you want to grow that into a real business. You want to take share, but obviously the new technology does not have the same cost structure as the old search query, right? I'm sure that whatever you're doing with OpenAI, it's more compute intensive. And then obviously you have a partner sitting in the middle of it. And then the monetization model is still search ads, right? It's direct response search ads. But as you bring more and more content on the screen, that model might change or the price of those ads might change. What Are you, great. huh? It's so wonderful. I mean, yeah. just think about what you just said. You said, okay, here is the largest software category mm -hmm. where we have the smallest share and what you just painted out is an unbelievable picture of incremental GM. If Steve Ballmer saw that, he would have like <laughs> lit up and said, oh my God, very few times in history do opportunities like that show up where you suddenly can start a new race mm -hmm. with a base where every day is incremental GM for you uh, and someone else has to play to protect it all, every user and all the GM. So I want to wrap up with two questions here. One, I just want to come back to this. I think you are going to face a lot of scrutiny from publishers, creators, 
other website owners saying, hey, that is our training data. You're already seeing it, right? Getty is suing a handful of the image generation AI companies saying, hey, you tra you're, you're generating results with our watermark in it, right? This is obviously ours. So I'm curious if you have a view of the potential IP risk on the downside or on the positive side of how to grow and keep the ecosystem vibrant. I mean, on the search side, I'm very, very clear. The search category is about fair use so that we can generate traffic back to publishers. And so that's sort of we want to stay very... And is that a KPI that you're keeping track Absolutely. of traffic you're sending out? 100%. Like, I mean, that's the only way we're going to be... Our, our bots are not going to be allowed to crawl search uh, if we are uh, not driving traffic. So therefore, uh, that, I think, is the core of the category. In other places, again, it'll have to be really uh, thought through as to what, mm -hmm. what is the fair use. And yeah. then sometimes, I think there'll be some legal cases that will also have to create precedent. Uh, but at the end of the day, I don't think this any of this uh, can be done without a framework of law that governs it and ultimately financial incentives that benefit. If anything, I look at this and say, God, is this something where the fact that there's going to be more com competition can really help publishers get more monetization, advertiser get, advertisers get better returns for their investment, and users have more choice. All right, I want to end with a question that I think is the most important question of all. You have described a transformational moment in the largest software category in the world. You've said it, obviously, there's a moment of increased competition against the dominant player. What was it like in the room when you decided to stick with the Bing brand? Right, there had to have been a slide with like 50 options, I'm assuming it's Microsoft. There's some passionate back and forth <laughs> debate. Eventually, someone decides. Was it you who decided? Yeah, we wanted to call it Azure Search 2023 <laughs> Xbox edition. Live Search. <laughs> no, 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 or, or bring back Clippy. And, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. No, look, we, there was, it's not a really, interestingly enough, it was not much of a discussion because we felt, look, we've been, we love Bing. We have been at it. I was there the day of launch <laughs> of Bing. I worked on it. But it has a lot of baggage as a brand. You know, it's like, look, brands can be rebuilt as long mm -hmm. as there's innovation. I, I think the brands are only as good as the product and as good as the innovation, and so we're going to go work it. And that was your choice? Absolutely. All right. Well, Sasha, thank you so much for talking today. It was really exciting to see all the new stuff. I'm eager to see how it grows in the future. Thank you so much, Nile. That's great. I have like 50 more, but I'm get, I'm, I can feel the waves <laughs> all around me. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. Huh? That was great. Huh? Thanks again for Sacha for taking the time to talk to me on Decoder. Open your podcast app. Subscribe to Decoder. I host it. It's great. It's a lot of conversations like that. Tom Warren and I are here at Microsoft. We're going to be trying out the new Bing. Stay tuned. Lots of videos, hands-on impressions, uh, and maybe a little bit more coming from Microsoft.